Friday Night Lights. Voice search lets you simply speak to watch anything. Can't remember the channel number? Just speak it. Golf Channel. Can't remember where your show is on? Just speak it. Friday Night Lights. Google TV can help you even if you can't remember the name of the show. TV show about fantasy football. Want to pick up a new skill? How to paint your body in team colors. Whatever you want, just speak it. Friday football highlights. And again, the internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. If I were the man I was five years ago, I'd take a flame through to this plane. When you're, when you're telling these little stories, here's a good idea. Have a point. It makes it so much more interesting for the listener. I wouldn't trust this overgrown pile of microchips any further than I can throw it. Oh, oh, the other. The no! There's a force in the universe. Makes things happen. All you have to do is get in touch with it. Stop thinking. Let things happen. Be the ball. There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? Welcome to Discultured for the week of Wednesday, the 14th of November, 2012. I am not Anthony Marco, not from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I am Andrew Curry, however, from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and this is uh, Ryan Wiseman in Owen Sound, Ontario, Canada. And again, all by myself, holding up most of this country because of these centric Ontarians. I am Shane from Vancouver, British Columbia. Very nice. And if you're wondering where Mr. Marco is, he is indeed with us. Unfortunately, uh, something's up with his voice, uh, so he's only going to be speaking in low guttural noises. Isn't that right, Anth? Mm. There he is. All right. So uh, we do have uh, a show, however. Uh, I'm going to be driving for the first time, so go easy on me. There may be uh, a couple of gaffes here and there, but I'm going to try and run a tight ship. I'm going to try and clock this baby in under three hours. So let's get started. We've got about 400 links. Uh, off the top of the show, the first thing you very heard, uh, uh, the first thing you heard rather, was a uh, link submitted to our Reddit from Mr. Ryan Wiseman uh, about Google TV and a new voice search function. And uh, uh, Ryan, I'm sure you had a chance to uh, watch the video. Shane, Anth, maybe not so much. The one thing that struck me is that the guy doing the voice search seemed especially sad and lonely uh, searching for sports-related things on a Friday night. Yeah, I just don't like I just don't like voice search from the couch. It doesn't make I don't like yelling searches. It doesn't make I think it's awesome. Me. I think this is the best technology ever created. It's an interesting technology and it's kind of cool that it exists, but it's not like oh, I want an assassin movie. <laughs> That's kind of like how the cool Netflix would that be if you'd that. actually shout no, that out to your TV ninja. and suddenly you're... <laughs> give me ninjas. No, me- those are not nin- those are I don't know. Anyways, Google's going to make <laughs> uh, it easier and easier for us to yell at our TV. Uh, Anthony Marco, yeah or nay on voice search from your couch? I can't yell anything. <laughs> Fair enough. So we should have seen so, so horrible. You, you are listening to Disculture. This is a weekly podcast we do from a uh, Canadian backwater perspective of world events, technology, pop culture, politics, uh, copyright, things of that nature. Uh, you can find us at disculture.com. We do a live uh, stream broadcast every Wednesday night. There's some people in the chat uh, right now. Uh, that uh, address is uh, disculture.com slash live. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Google+. Plus. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on iTunes. Uh, but the most most important thing you have to remember is that when you spell discultured, you must always spell it with the Y. And why is that, Mr. Shane Burley? Why haven't we started into the links already? You promised me efficient running of the show. And right now, we're, we're just getting to the Y part. So I, I think we should be further along by now. What do you guys think? You know what I think? Mm-hmm. Very nice. Mr. Wiseman, our producer here. <laughs> Even Anthony approves. <laughs> that's, 
That's about as good as you're going to get from him tonight, I think. So we always lead off with Canadian news. Uh, tonight is no different. Uh, we have a story that was actually submitted uh, by Mr. Steve Chaika, who we had as a guest on a show uh, a few months ago. Uh, he's one of the founders of the GIMP magazine. Uh, he submitted this via Twitter, and we were more than happy to put it in our Reddit, uh, which is, uh, by the way, uh, by the way, disculture.reddit.com. You can submit stories there. Uh, we love that because that's where you go to for all our links. Uh, and this particular story is from a site called Tellery.com. Uh, long story short, uh, the person who wrote this post is basically saying, uh, look, if you're uh, going to download a book which is illegal uh, or, or if you're going to buy something legally and then break the lock uh, for your own personal use, which would probably be called fair use in the United States, you might as – seeing how you're breaking the law anyway, you might as well go ahead and download the copy because at least it doesn't have any locks on it. Uh, Shane, what do you make of this? I don't download anything illegally, so I'm unfamiliar with what exactly he's talking about because, you know, I play by the rules all the time, and I spend thousands upon thousands of dollars every single year uh, buying uh, and consuming uh, media content. It's it's quite a, a defeat that I have to do, but, uh, you know, I'm willing to, uh, you know, to, to really, you know, take one for the team because... You know, I, I just think that uh, it's something that everyone should get behind. You know, being a responsible consumer of uh, of all kinds of things, uh, especially in Canada. So uh, if you if you take things like uh, books, for example, you know, like those things you can download, uh, why not go to your local bookstore? Why are you not like going and picking up a physical paper copy? Because you know what, you can't take an e-reader and rub it against your body when you're in bed trying to read. Uh, and not feel weird about it. You gotta, you gotta take the real thing, because you know people have been doing that for so long. Uh, rubbing paper against your body is a perfectly acceptable thing to do in the privacy of your own home. That's why oh, and, the and used bookstore smells that, that way. way mm hmm. You you didn't just say, Andrew, that I would be better off to download it illegally than to break the lock myself, did you? Uh. uh... Technically, yes, because I believe I don't have all the nuances of Bill C-11 in front of me, which became law this past week, by the way. Uh, but Jesse I Brown's made this article. <laughs> Jesse Brown's made this argument before that it's like uh, pirated content is basically a superior product because there's no digital restrictions on it. You can get it sooner. The quality is usually better. So really, from just a sheer consumerist perspective, you're actually getting the best possible deal from something that you download off a torrent site. Um, Funny that you say use books, Shane, because my brother, I was having an argument with my brother about electronic books, uh, and he was saying that he prefers buying paper books, even though they're um, quick. Uh, I don't know if they're obsolete yet, but they're sort of going down that road, uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, his argument is that he always buys physical books because uh, he reads them and then sells them, and he's fairly confident that he can still reap like a 30% uh, gain on the original purchase price uh, of the book that he bought. Um, you know, me, if I'm going to buy a book, uh, when I did buy physical books, I was a big fan of giving them away. If I wanted someone to read this, it's like, okay, hey, this is really cool. You should check this out. Uh, or if I really, really wanted to hoard it, then I would, you know, put it in an exalted spot on my bookshelf. Um, uh, when it comes to electronic media, though, I, I can only think back to when I had my iTunes digital uh, music library that I had a lot of purchased music on it straight from the iTunes music store. Wouldn't play on Linux. The only way I could transfer that music over was to liberate it, and I basically had to break all the locks. And now that would be illegal. Had I done that this week instead of four years ago, uh, I would have been breaking the law. I'm not entirely comfortable with that. Um, no, I think I, – I mean we all know already that Bill C-11 is not going to answer the questions that really need to be answered. It's really more or less still going along the road of knee-jerk reaction or researched knee-jerk reaction if that's even possible. But – I, I I have to really give it up for the people that uh, are writing these things because they are the most disjointed and uninformed group that I have ever had the pleasure of laughing at. Um, you, you're talking about the lawmakers. The lawmakers, yes. Because uh -huh. the thing is, is that they're trying to they're trying to make it better for everybody. They're trying to be fair to both publishers as well as uh, as as the consumers themselves. The problem is that at the moment there is no real easy answer because uh, we're living, unfortunately, more and more so in the age of the millennials that uh, have been for the past you know decade 
had access to information uh, at the at their you know generally at their fingertips where they can look stuff up instantly within you know a few minutes. But we're kind of those those the ones that are lagging behind. You know, we're, we're sure we're, we're you know I mean I'm speaking uh, for the people on the show is that. You know, we're we're kind of nerdy. We're kind we know what's what's going on. We know how to break digital locks. Uh, I guess we don't. Uh, but at the same time, um, they're trying to deal with people that aren't us, and they're not that successful at it uh, at this point. But again, um, I can't fault them for trying. I suppose is what I'm trying to say in a, in a nice way that I I, miss, I support what they're trying to do, but until all millennials are the ones running an office in, in countries all over the place. I don't think we're going to see much of a change. Well, that's a fair point. I, uh, the other thing I worry about is, in, in a broader sense, I guess, is the whole thing about vendor lock-in, right? It's the same reason why somebody continually upgrades an iPhone because they're locked into the iTunes music store. They keep getting Macs because they're locked into iTunes. It's much the same way with eBooks. If you're buying stuff from Kindle, now that it's illegal to break locks, there's no way in hell you're ever going to move to, uh, what's the other one, Kobo or uh, Nook. I guess that's not technically available in Canada. But um, as a parent, Mr. Wiseman, are you going to let your children grow up loyal to one platform and not understanding that computers are generative devices and can be repurposed uh, and media in much the same way? It's a loaded question. Yeah, I know. Uh, I don't know if I've ranted in here before about uh, uh, my son coming home and talking about what they would do. They'd open up uh, doing a writing exercise and using Microsoft Word. Like, oh. like, but it was like it, it was like spelled out with like a, it was like and then you open Microsoft Power or Microsoft Word desktop editor and i was like whoa okay that sounds yeah what generation wrote that no i mean it's still happening right now and school boards all across this country my friend there's no school board in canada that i'm aware of that's on linux distributions uh the um, only school board or actually not necessarily school board, but the, but, but uh the only ones that i do know that are fully on linux um happen to be in calgary just because i have a friend who's a nerd and works there uh, he works for, but it's, but again, it, it's a private school. It's like yeah, Catholic okay. it's, school, or whatever. And they're entirely on Linux and have been for like the, the last decade. Good which I think it's kind of the cool. The country look but, there. Yeah, well, exactly. And then, but I don't know of any public school system uh, that is even. I mean, hell, I, I, my, uh, a couple of friends that uh, I know that have kids are talking about how, you know, they're having to learn stupid things like, uh, uh, you know, Microsoft Word you know, 95 and crap like that in some so situations. That's the software side of things, and I'm not really worried about that one. I, I can see already that, like, my son will be, you know, transferable across. He'll be able to work in any of these environs. Uh, I, was, I just said that's the software side. What was I going to go there from to the... Um, Hardware? Hardware? Oh, no, you asked, about, you asked about media. And I think mm. my attitude towards media is, uh, and, and it could be, uh, well, it, it's that, how much of this stuff do we really need to keep? Do we really go back and watch any or all of this stuff in the first place? Uh, I think I just feel like we're charging ahead so quickly that a lot of the, like, do I need an episode of Dexter or a season of something kept, or do I just keep just show me what's new and interesting and let you keep keep on? Uh, don't say that because then you're gonna have those self destructing DVDs and eBooks. Well, uh, oh. No. I guess there's two different things at play here, right? There's the technological locks and things that exist, and then there's the does the is there really actually a demand? Does all that smelly stuff in the library or in the you know the secondhand shop actually like it, is eighty percent of it actually like the one time use and then just kind of sit there and never get looked at again? I think that might be. I think it really depends on the person. I mean, I I for one am the type that will go back and read a and quote paper book. Hello. Uh, I don't know what I say that for, but anyway. Um, but, but I do go back and I do read those and I do revisit stuff that I have uh, read already and I do uh, watch films that I've seen a hundred times. Um, it's in the cabinet beside me. You know, is the, kind of the point I'm making. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> so quickly before we leave this, uh, Mr. Marco, uh, you do have an Android tablet, if I'm not mistaken. Have you read an ebook on it and did you buy it legally? Yes, I bought it legally, and I've only read about one third of the book. Is it because DRM gets in the way, or just the experience isn't the same as a physical book? Or it's because reading on a tablet is 
sucks balls. <laughs> All right. Which takes us into a section we like to call Copy Fight! Uh, early in the show, and I get the fablet reaction from Mr. Marco. Mm. It's going to be a good night. Uh, here's a story from Tech Dirt uh, from Mr. Mike Masnick, the prolific Tech Dirt writer. Uh, so I think we've talked about this before. There was a uh, there's a Japanese copyright law that just came into effect uh, this past week, apparently. And uh, unbeknownst to the people who uh, probably came up with the law... Uh, it seems that digital music sales are actually suffering as a result of it. Uh, apparently, and this is partly a cultural thing, I know from um, visiting uh, Japan a couple of times now, that uh, Japanese people seem to be very, very consumer-friendly. They like they like buying things. One of the reasons why the um, iMode, the first uh, successful mobile internet, was so successful in Japan is because people actually paid per page. So it was more like, uh, it was more like a pay-as-you-go thing than sort of the unlimited free-for-all internet that we had uh, over here in the west so uh people in japan are apparently so afraid of being uh, arrested that they're not buying anything online at all at least when it comes to music uh mr wiseman are we surprised by this um well japan has always been ahead of the times in technology and other things so they would be leading us into the age of being scared shitless of buying music because of litigious rias and such yeah <laughs> So this would be a good thing. I should do a quick search for Japanese bands on Jimendo. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know if either of you or anyone here and, and is uh, is like a fan of Japanese culture, like the J- Japanese because they're so isolated. And I'm I'm speaking in broad strokes here. I'm not an expert on Japan by any means, but uh, my understanding is that because they're more isolated than other parts of Asia, they have their own very uh, prolific music industry, their own movie industry, uh, lots of TV shows, and then uh, feeding it all is this uh, whole um, anime manga kind of thing. Um, so so they definitely got lots of media production going on. Um, I wonder if this is a good thing for pe- people in Japan who want to put out music or media for free. Is it um what what is the fear, the download part? Uh the fear is getting caught from an illegal download. So if somehow the laws change, I think it's uh basically by by making something illegal, they're basically Japanese because they don't want to get in trouble. Or at least according to the story. Now I'm sounding like a racist. This damn, Mike, Mike Masnick, you're like totally setting me up here. So, okay. So the reality is that this is directly from the article now. Consumers are spending less on music than they were before the bill became law. The article actually posits that the government has made some people so fearful of being arrested that they won't do any downloading from legitimate sources anymore. Just in case it's tainted. So I guess they're worried about websites being spoofed or somehow the laws changing or somehow being implicated in something that if it's not illegal today, might become illegal tomorrow. You know, I'd be interested to see. I, I haven't actually looked ever um, if there is like a Creative Commons version for Japan. There must be, I would think. I'm going to look it up. But I'm curious if um, if any of these artists that are producing the work actually are aware of this problem and not just the downloaders, that maybe they are potentially going to, uh, you know, create something that is, uh, you know, use a, as I said, a, like a Creative Commons license of some sort. Um, I don't see why to not. try and make it better. I, I don't know. I I think it sucks all the way, around, all the way through with this entire idea, but I just don't understand why the artists aren't, because here's the thing, we, we've gone through the whole artist upheaval here for people that are creating some of the stuff to, uh, you know, take control of, um, you know, take control of their of their own work. Um, but we're still, I guess, I guess, really here we're still suffering through the uh, through the old, um, just the old world. I'm calling it the old world, but you know, uh, the old media world, and so. I don't know. I just think that it's really unfortunate that uh, we don't have uh, a bit more progress, especially in countries like Japan, who are really addicted to their mobile phones and things like that. It's, uh, it's just you know more so than here. 
it is like part part of the story. I should be clear. Like part part of this is cultural. Like there are things that are unique to Japan, but part of it is universal. And I think the universal part for me, at least, is that uh, when like think about when Napster was around, and and I'm sort of paraphrasing the first comment of the story. When Napster came around, like tons of people were exposed to like tons and tons and tons of new music. You know, you could search for any kind of keyword, like, I don't know, chocolate balls or something, and enjoy a number of new artists that you would have never otherwise heard of. And a lot of people ended up going out and buying music because of stuff they heard on Napster. Uh, this is a case of the opposite happening. You're making it clear. You're, the government is coming down, making a stance and saying there, there will be consequences for illegal downloading of music. So instead of people buying more music online, they're buying less uh, they're just staying away from online music stores altogether. They're listening think, to the radio more. They're listening to RDO. They're listening to whatever. They're hanging out on social media and listening to each other. Is that what they're doing with their time? Or with yeah, their... this is the other thing. I mean, there's more. I don't. I don't know the state of Japan's economy right now, but I mean, the, in as we know in the West, like there's more things that are competing for our attention, right? So it may well be that, yeah, they're just going spending their money elsewhere, and maybe one of those one of those things are paid music services. So. Anyway, this was voted up high on the Reddit. So people who <laughs> submitted this story, you only have yourselves to blame. But of course we love you. Uh, yeah. And to prove that we love you, we're going to go into uh, a section of the story and, and, uh, and have a story, especially for someone in the chat tonight, Mr. Jeff Gignac, who I know is a steadfast BlackBerry user. And Jeff, this next story is for you as we go mobile. Watch the police and the tax man miss me. Oh, oh. Okay, so we have a date with BlackBerry 10. Uh, this is from crackberry.com. BlackBerry 10 launch event to be held on January 30th, 2013. Uh, RIM announced today that it will hold BlackBerry 10 launch event uh, simultaneously in multiple com- countries around the world. The day will mark the official launch of its new platform, BlackBerry 10, as well as the unveiling of two BlackBerry 10 devices. Uh, do we think that this is a Hail Mary kind of last ditch effort for BlackBerry to be relevant? Or do we think this is a return to the throne for Canada's smartphone success story? Hail Mary. I really, I really, I, I have high hopes for this move. I really do. I've been secretly kind of, you know, crossing some fingers and, and whatnot. But I, I don't know. I, just in the last couple of weeks, I've had to set up some Blackberries to run with, uh, you know, a, this this email service that you may have heard of called Gmail, and uh, it was excruciating, and it was a painful, painful process. The client, you know, who had bought this phone was very, very upset uh, that it wasn't as easy as you know the Blackberry people, you know, said it would be. Uh, who these BlackBerry people? I don't know. This is just what they told me. Um, but they're still around. Like there, there are still BlackBerry users out there. I know them. I've seen them. And yeah, have, and I, uh, I just happened to run into two. That and one of them has like a BlackBerry Torch, and one has um, uh, a BlackBerry. Oh crap! What is it called? I can't remember now. But anyway, with the ninety six hundred or whatever it was, and uh, they had a. They, they they did nothing but really complain about it because they had such an awful time trying to configure these things and but I'm and, and you know I, I'm not talking about you know people that have some technology like these are, the, are very very basic users that uh, that uh, I, it turns out uh, they were running uh, uh, BlackBerry OS six is that right uh, oh, which is please. a bit older well it, this is the thing is I believe that one's a bit older. And uh, and I said, well, have you actually attempted to uh, to upgrade the OS? And uh, to, you know, to, I think it was seven seven point whatever uh, that I, I just you know Googled it and was like, oh, it's actually seven. You should be running, and here's how to do it. And it was like trying to explain high level physics to them that uh, you know upgrading the operating system on your on my phone. What are you talking about? Um, I, which yeah, you know, if you're an Apple Blackboard user, way. happens all the time, but. Uh, so I flashed the BlackBerry once, and what I didn't like about it was that it wasn't it wasn't on the device. I had to hook it up to a computer, and because BlackBerry's all about the proprietary stuff, like the only thing available is either Mac or PC. So luckily, girlfriend had a MacBook, had the BlackBerry whatever installer, and I yeah I didn't like the fact that I needed to tether it to a device. 
Yeah, um, it was very strange. I mean, Apple and iPhones, those things, and especially iPads, uh, had that same have had that same requirement up until just recently, like in the last uh, say six months, um, mm. that the latest OS actually does the wireless upgrading and stuff like that now. Yeah, um, that's good. I, I was going to say, mean, I turned on my Android phone with my Android thing, and it was able to update like that. There you go. Uh, and I was going to say that remember, uh, it wasn't the last time we met at the lovely Sheraton center in downtown Toronto, but I believe maybe the time before there was a friend or colleague of yours who joined us for dinner and he just got his new Blackberry bold, uh, possibly from work, possibly not. But do you know, does that guy still have his, does he still like it? Uh, haven't heard any updates about it, which okay. tells me that either it's nothing great or nothing bad or that they're still stuck to using it <laughs> or that it's not working and he can't contact you. My my thing about, thing about this, oh sorry uh, no I was gonna say my thing about BlackBerry is that I uh, I think they're doing their their users a disservice by going to like all touch uh, I briefly played when the first all touch BlackBerry came out uh, I can't remember what the technology is called but the screen actually like had it was clickable like when you press something in the screen there was an, actually an audible click and the screen moved a yeah, bit yeah I think that was the first Torch version. Um, right. I heard from a client who had bought one right away uh, when it first came out um, was just livid that this thing was making this noise and doing that kind of stuff um, to uh, where he actually threw it across his office and shattered it um, oh because he had to put a, like a, a I think his interim solution for the first little while was he threw he like, took a credit card and cut a credit card up and uh, so that it it made the screen uh, a little more rigid, so that the clicking wasn't so pronounced. And uh, but ended up as he phoned me up one day and said, "Hey, I got a new phone. It's an iPhone." I said, "Oh, good for you." Uh, and he said, "Well, I I need you to help me set it up because uh, you know I, I don't know how, but I I threw my my torch across the room and it broke. So and he showed me the carcass of it and he tossed it pretty damn hard." But um, I, yeah. I think the, the new the new Blackberries, I think, with like the decision to go all touch, I think, does a disservice to all the people who are used to the keyboards. And most most Blackberries I see out there, like among friends and just people around, you know, uh, the city as I sort of come and go, are, are people who have the ones with the keyboards. And the keyboard, there's there's definitely still a place for a good QWERTY keyboard. And if you're emailing and messaging, uh, you know, the way Blackberry users write emails is a whole other matter, which I can maybe get into here, but I shouldn't because I'll go off on a tangent. It'll probably take about a half an hour. Don't write the email in the fucking subject line. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know that a lot of people who were used to Blackberry, as a matter of fact, Jeff, I'm going to put this to you. Jeff Gignac who's in the chat tonight. Uh, what do you think about keyboard Blackberries versus touch Blackberries? Like if your only option is an all touch device, are you still interested? And now there's dead silence while he's waiting. Well, he's doing uh, that. I'll, I'll give a couple <laughs> things I think here just real quick. The um, actually, he did say there was a keyboard version. The the email, the the flow, which I think is one of the new uh, the landing page for BlackBerry 10 in terms of like what's on this new fancy operating system that we're going to get blows. There's no information. It's just pictures of the damn president and big titles. Worst thing I've ever seen. Go look for it. Uh, and then second to that, yeah, somewhere before that, maybe it was in the article, they were talking about flow, BlackBerry flow. It's like the unification of all of your everything. I don't, I don't, all I ever see BlackBerry users doing is texting. I don't know. Well, don't actually, th- not even texting, using that BBM, right? Which is yeah. the um, proprietary messaging service. So the, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not so, excited or not. I'm not excited or not excited. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Jeff has just posted a link in the chat, which is very uh, helpful. It's at uh, uh, bgr.com. Um, I'm not going to give the URL out over the podcast because I don't expect you to copy it down that much. You should really be here in the chat, though. 2012 but, forward slash 09. Forward <laughs> so what he's saying, though, is that there's apparently going to be uh, two hardware options. One's going to have a physical QWERTY keypad and one not. And that's good. Um, I, I want Rim to, Rim to do well. I think, you know, they're a Canadian company. They, they have a place. They're, they're people who swear by them. 
Uh, I don't know, given that last week we were talking about Android and how they're basically going to be the next Microsoft by the end of uh, next year, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what percent of the market is going to be available for BlackBerry uh, going forward. But, um, you know, yeah, I'd like to see them do okay. Um, I don't know where their stock is at versus Nokia, but I, I kind of lumped those two companies in the same boat. Anyway, moving on, because uh, <laughs> we all really want to talk about Android. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, so if you didn't know, uh, we were talking about this last week. Uh, Google released this new Nexus uh, flagship phone, uh, and they're not releasing it through carriers like they did the last uh, two previous uh, Nexus devices. What they're doing is the same thing they did with the original Nexus One in the United States only, uh, and more recently with the Nexus 7 tablet. Uh, when it first launches, that they're only selling it through their website. So uh, what they did was at... Uh, I think it was 9 o'clock uh, Pacific time, Tuesday morning, they said, okay, we're going to start selling them in limited amounts. And, of course, what happened, just bedlam. Everywhere across the world is like, I, I can't get it. I don't know. Ah, this sucks. Ah, it's unbelievable. So uh, given that there were probably very few devices to sell in the first place, and given that there are a lot of unhappy people out there, and I personally know at least one, it's not me. Uh, I'm going to wait. Um do we think here on Discultured that this is a complete fail on behalf of Google, that they botched the launch and that they're never going to recover from this? Or do we think this, this is the most savvy, savvy marketing thing ever? Or somewhere in between? Anf, go. No Nexus for you. <laughs> That's no pretty Nexus? much what the Google Play Store said. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the the really smart people. Apparently, uh, I saw on Reddit somebody wrote a Grease Monkey script, and if you didn't know, Grease Monkey is an extension for Firefox, which does um, some kind of scripting thing. So somebody somebody wrote a Grease Monkey script that basically would uh, ping the Google Play Store, and as soon as the as soon as the device went from coming soon to add to cart, uh, it would yell out tacos, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is kind of cool. Uh, Shane, I know you're extremely happy with your uh, with your GS3. Uh, Ryan, you don't seem to be interested in upgrading your phone anytime soon. Uh, not for any, one year. Not for one. Oh, you just got something? Or are you still in a three year contract? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Damn. Uh, I feel for you. Um, any thoughts on selling things directly over the internet? Because it's it is a little. There's some minuses definitely in, in terms of Canadian customers because, number one, the warranty issue is a bit harder because if there's something wrong with the phone, you have to mail it back as opposed to going to your carrier. Uh, the unlocked thing is great. I'm kind of of the opinion now that a lot of people really don't care. They just want it to work. Um, I don't know. I, I Any, think so yeah, but, too. I, I mean, especially when uh, – Especially when you can go to a carrier and actually pick and choose what it is that you want. And that's why I went with, that's why I changed carriers again, uh, was that I wanted a particular phone and I couldn't get it anywhere else that would be compatible and all that kind of crap. Um, but I'm actually quite happy about it. I'm very, very happy that, that, you, that you were able to do this because it just, it says it to me. It says a big fu to the to the carriers in, in this country, and whether that's actually going to be a successful attack, I don't know. For people that actually go and buy them online, but yeah, I don't know. I I just have to say that that I'm I'm terribly happy that there is yet again another Hitler rant. Uh, oh yeah, about, the... about this whole situation. <laughs> I did see that. Although the person who. Uh posted it to YouTube, made it private for some reason, so maybe I'll look at the wrong one. Uh, what, what were we going to say, Ryan? I wasn't. I've gone down the <laughs> rabbit I've gone, I've gone down the rabbit hole of reading the... Uh, the um, There's a tiny chat that was associated with the Google article. It's That's not. fine. That's totally fine. We I read show notes in the air, too. Uh, I Originally, actually, I had a... I posted to the comments for a mobile syrup, and it was basically just people complaining that they couldn't get one. Uh, I know, Anth, you uh, you have some interest in the Nexus 4 as your next device. Is what happened on Tuesday morning, is that making you more or less likely to buy one? I I think if it if the product gets proven out that it's a good product, I'm willing to wait for it. So, I mean, every single provider plays games with this, don't they? I mean, when, yeah. when the iPhone first comes out, when the iPad first comes out, I mean, they intentionally short their stock. 
they stop short, so to speak. That's everybody's move to treat, and it's a marketing game, so that people will write about it, and so that I guess we'll talk about it. Can I just say that you sound like grade nine Anthony giving his first presentation in English class? Um, hi, Mr. Curry. <laughs> Mr. Curry. It's adorable. I sir. have to go to the bathroom, Mr. Curry. <laughs> uh, one other thing quickly that uh, I didn't realize on launch day, apparently the Nexus 4 takes a micro SIM, which only means that I have to go and get a new SIM. And then if I want to put that SIM in another phone that doesn't take a micro SIM, it does I have to get an adapter. And I hate that shit. But anyway, I guess it's progress. Uh, we should probably move on, speaking of progress, to a place that maybe doesn't have so much progress or more, depending on your point of view. It's a section of the show we like to call China Watch. I'm when I get excited, my little China girl says, oh baby, just you shut your mouth. So we have a story from a site called greatfire.org, which is apparently devoted to the Great Firewall of China. Apparently, uh, google.com is blocked and all its subdomains. So Gmail, uh, Google Drive, the Play Store, everything Google is blocked in China. Uh, people are thinking that it might be temporary because right now the 18th uh, Chinese Party Congress is going on. Uh, and, and my understanding of that is that it's basically like a big dog and pony show. Everybody from all the different territories or provinces or however they divide China up because it's fucking huge. Uh, everybody comes from every dark corner of China and they all meet in this big building and they vote on things which either don't matter or have already been decided. Um so uh, I definitely have some thoughts on this, uh, but I'm interested in hearing what you guys first so I can correct you. <laughs> that um, I think my main reaction is uh, I don't care. Um, mainly because there's not a huge amount I can do about it. I mean, I can complain and whatnot. But short of Russia rolling over in the middle of the night and crushing them and installing their own firewall, uh, I, yeah. I just I yeah I I I mean I, what can you what can I do as an individual really? Um, you know I think this sucks and I think it's awful, but um, it's also not unexpected in my world. So yeah, I, th I think part of the outcry. Uh, and I'm I'm kind of relieved that you say you don't care because I think a lot of the art cry comes from the fact that people equate Google with like freedom in the same way uh, I've gone on in the past about um, Twitter and how when you know Twitter is shut down in in different countries a lot of it is a cultural thing and you have to appreciate that okay Google might be like you know the shining beacon of freedom and forward thinking and tech technological utopia here in the West. In other parts of the world, it's just another commercial internet service. And my understanding is in China, it's one that's actually not that um, dependable. Like, it's pretty flaky. It's sort of been off and on. Like, ever since uh, ever since Google moved out of Beijing or Hong Kong or wherever they were, uh, the, surfaces, the, the services have been kind of intermittent at best. So not as many people depend on it as you might think. Although, uh, according to this site, they had a fairly big number. They said it's five, 500 million people still use it. Which I'm, I'm guessing that's just because China is so ginormously huge. It's you know the number one search engine in China is a Chinese company. It's called Baidu, and we all know that um, the internet is filtered by the government. The the internet is a state-run enterprise. Uh, you know, it would be it would be nice if Google worked there. If Google worked there for sure, but I have a feeling a lot of the complaints might be coming from foreign workers and expats and English-speaking people who are living there. Yeah. I would, I would, I would agree. What do you think, Ryan? Is this a th kind of a throwback to the whole Google, Google's China policy in terms of whatever it was uh, a, a while ago? Like, were they not threatened to be kicked out of China anyway? Uh, I seem to remember that. Uh, I don't remember all the facts. I know they were. I believe they moved out of mainland China into Hong Kong, and then I think they left Hong Kong altogether. Uh, the one thing I do know is that, you know, China, China has its own, 
uh, they use Android, or at least they use the open source version of Android. They don't need Google. Like, they've got their own yeah. versions of webmail and chat and everything else. And, of course, yeah, they're all filtered by the government. But on the other hand, they're made for a Chinese market. Like, they're Chinese from the start. All the iconography and, and uh, you know, the advertising and everything else appeals to specifically a Chinese audience. Um so I don't know. I mean, yeah, I would like for Google to work there. I would like for people to have choice. But honestly, I wonder if it's, you know, not dissimilar to the fact that uh, I, I wonder if there would be as much outcry if Plurk started wor- stopped working in Canada. <laughs> there, I went there. I'm gonna Anthony Marco, right what's your latest update on Plurk? Plurk, schmirk. So, <laughs> somebody should write a Grease Monkey script that reels tacos when Plurk officially goes under <laughs> fire wall fire small there you go channeling a little i wonder bit what uh cluster. what my cloud score is right now hang on oh here we oh. go while he checks that uh we are going to go to another section of the show we like to call tired old meat they're gonna put me in the movies uh, so this is a story out of uh, Slate magazine, which I believe is owned by Microsoft. Uh, and uh, the headline is, Google has officially eaten the newspaper industry. Apparently this year for the first time, the um, uh, net revenue from all of Google's advertising products is more than all of the revenue of the new uh, U.S. I believe it's newspaper, magazine, all print industries combined. Um the story starts off with someone who was uh, attending some sort of symposium with somebody from Google talking about how newspapers were their best friends and they want to see the growth and continued sustainability of newspapers because they're a premium partner for content. And now it seems like Google doesn't really give a fuck. Um, are we surprised by this? Not I'm, I'm not surprised by it, uh, mainly because I think that most newspapers, and I've said this before, shot themselves in the foot a decade ago uh, and didn't put up paywalls instantly or have some sort of way where they could gain revenue. Um, And now Google, I mean, all Google really did is just aggregate stuff that those people were releasing for free. And we've had people before talking about how, uh, you know, these, these smaller papers that sued Google, what, last year, I think, and uh, sued them because they felt that they should be getting a, a, a better cut of what uh, Google was pulling in. And uh, they basically, Google said, well, we could remove you from, from, the, from the Google News section. And they said, yeah, thanks very much, blah, blah, blah. And, and they essentially won to a certain degree, I guess. Um, but the newspapers then went under because no one was reading them because it turned out that the bulk of their content and the bulk of their traffic was being redirected from the Google News pages. So yeah. I know I read Google News. like That's the first place I, I, I do, too. It's very convenient. Um, but the thing is, people could also do it other ways. If, if there's a newspaper that is releasing their content via an RSS feed, they could do it with any number of, of readers entirely um, and not actually you know, have to use or not actually use Google uh, News itself, but I, I have to say that, I mean, I, I, I kind of have turned into, in the past little while, I've turned into kind of a, a Google nerd because um, I, I just, I use the products, the, you know, a bunch of their products and they do what I want them to do and I'm quite happy with that and I could care less if they have my information and um, because I'm not going to be able to build my own stuff that would do exactly what I wanted to do. So anyway, um, uh, what were we going to say, Ryan? I know I really should throw to one of you. I'm sorry. I'm being a bad driver tonight, but I promise I'll do better in the future. So Ryan, your thoughts, uh, just, uh, just on the death of the newspaper industry, a lot uh, like breaking out of Owen sound today. Uh, the, uh, three new, three, three positions cut from the newsroom of our local paper. I'm surprised we actually have a local paper anyways. Uh, and then uh, publisher gone. And that's a throwback to an article from a couple of weeks ago where we, Talked about Quebec or media is going to basically have are replacing local editors with um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Advertising managers. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, like, yeah, the, the uh, slaughterama at the local level, lo- local level, uh, as far as uh, newspapers go. That's the direct result of 
what we were just talking about. Yeah, and it's not. I, I think a hundred percent of the blame should be on um, on Google News per se. Although that's that's a, a big part of it. That this piece also mentions the fact that a lot of newspapers are losing advertising revenues to Craigslist, uh, which is free for the users. Uh, they're also using like Yahoo is another news aggregator. Uh, there's uh, Anthony's going to love this HuffPo, HuffPo and AOL. I mean, they are a news <laughs> blog network. There you go. Either that or Anthony's hungry. <laughs> Uh, I know brains, a lot of, brains. <laughs> a lot of people on Facebook love the HuffPo, uh, and Facebook too is mentioned too because people do get their news off of Facebook. And God help me, they're also using those bullshit apps that, like, I'm sure there's an app for HuffPo, and if you want to read something that somebody else has shared in their Facebook wall, you have to get the Facebook app, which is total bullshit. But uh, it's yeah, I guess my thought is it's more a sign of the times. Um, Certainly, the the star of Global Mail putting up paywalls doesn't help. So, uh, do you think we can all agree that uh, the user or the people reading the news, the people who are on the internet, are probably the most important people, and their needs should be served first? That's us. Uh, I agree. I think that's the best thing I've ever ever heard. Thank you, sir. Monetize your awesome. monetize your users. Don't monetize your content. Uh, no one's going to monetize me because <laughs> I use Firefox, which <laughs> is a special section of the show that I don't know the title for. Uh, give me Khaki some. Khaki pants. Thank you, sir. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. And my Facebook updates with my tweet. So I Twitter. And then everybody knows my deep. <laughs> Okay, so Firefox turned eight years old this week, and uh, there's a post that we have in the show notes from the official Mozilla blog. I'm not really going to reference it other than the fact that, yes, they've turned eight, so happy birthday. Uh, I am going to briefly think back to 2004, I guess, when Firefox first came on the scene. Uh, I was still a Mac user then. I believe I was using Safari because that was my only choice. Uh, wasn't too happy about it. Uh, I know that Firefox has made a big impact on my um, internet life, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, I think, Shane, you could probably speak to the technical uh, things that Firefox brought to the table, if any. Uh, well, I mean, it's the, it, it introduced things like tabs, for example, which is a huge uh, adventure for most people when using a browser because uh, I mean I remember it took Internet Explorer or Exploder as I call it uh, eons to introduce tabbed browsing, um, but they also introduced uh, extensions you know things like uh, the that people could 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 write the software for and then it would somehow manipulate the content or the browser itself, uh, and then you have of course uh, things like ScriptMonkey where you could actually have uh, third-party scripts uh, doing different things to uh, to your browser without, uh, or uh, oh, sorry, and allowing you to you know, to edit them relatively easily. Um, I think for me the biggest thing with Firefox is that I've had a love-hate relationship with them for the past little while uh, because their Gecko engine. Now I'm getting really nerdy. Uh, started falling behind WebKit uh, in speed. And I was very happy when they started to adopt that uh, much, much more active uh, release schedule, um, which I think is a major release every six months. Is that right, I, Andrew? Or uh, It could be even more than that, because I know on my um, previous uh, distro, Linux Mint, like there were, there were a couple of updates coming down like every, I don't know, it seemed like there were maybe three in a month. Right. And they weren't dot releases. They were like new. It was like all of a sudden Firefox 9, 10, 11, 12. I think yeah, and, that, and that's right the now. thing is that I'm very happy they did that because I, when they started doing that, when they started adopting that release rate, I decided it was time for me to uh, go back to uh, paying attention uh, because I went strictly to Google Chrome after a while just because of the, the performance problem that I, that I didn't like. Um, but then they, within uh, them adopting that, within like a few months of that, they, re- you know, they released the next version of their of their rendering engine and all kinds of fun stuff. So um, I uh, and and also I know some people that actually work there now who work for um, for Mozilla, 
Uh, they used to they used to work in the department called Mozilla Messaging, I think it was what it was called, but they've now been wrapped into the rest. Um, and I really want to support them because as much as I like the Chrome you know, WebKit uh, thing, browser thing, browser, uh, I really, I don't know, I, I feel a lot better using Firefox be, you know, just because I, I find it to be a bit more solid and a bit more uh, user-friendly in the terms of being able to customize it. So, yeah, so I was just going to say that I, I stopped using Chrome only because I think I talked a couple of weeks about um, how I went from the open source Chromium to the official release of Chrome because I was having problems with Flash, I think. But the important thing is all of a sudden I noticed that my webcam was suddenly spying on me because it actually has like a, a status light that was like blinking and I was like, oh, that ain't right. So I did a well, little bit that, of research on me. it. Oh, okay. Anyway. Yeah, they, I, was, no, I was interested in what you were doing. Uh, well, this didn't really I, – I didn't click that <laughs> – I didn't click, click that EULA. But e- even when I was using Chrome and I was using it for a while, I always went to Firefox for banking or anything that was sensitive. Uh, I always liked Firefox, and uh, I love the extensions, especially the ad block one. I couldn't live without that. Uh, and more than anything else, I think I really appreciate that when you first install Firefox, a little window pops up uh, telling you about your user rights and all the stuff that Mozilla is doing to try to respect those user rights. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people don't read those, but I think I think that's like a really cool touch. And I appreciate the Mozilla Foundation for what it does. Uh, given that, and my basically freedom boner for Firefox, I'm almost afraid to ask, uh, Ryan, what's your browser of choice? Uh, I use them all, but I use Chrome predominantly, I would say. Okay, that's yeah. fair. And I know, Anth, you're a big fan of Chrome, right? Although I, like, I really don't care one way or the other. If I had the same kinds of extensions, it's just I found my way into one. Right. Yeah, no, it's it's good not to be, you know, a total fanboy and locked into one thing. Uh, I do use Opera for Facebook just because I want, you know, Facebook to be in its own sort of DMZ that it can't touch anything else. Um, Anth, I don't know if you're still there, but you're a big Chrome fan, right? Mr. Marco. Yeah, I'm here. I just muted myself because I was coughing. Ah. Um, I, I do use Chrome. I've used it pretty much ever since it came out in its first stable form. I was using Firefox before that. And I think I ran into the problem that a lot of people run into, which is you start loving the plugins and extensions to the point where it takes longer to load Firefox than it does to boot your system. And that becomes problematic because I've get, you have like 25 different extensions running, which everyone says are important to have, and ultimately they're not. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I do, I do remember when Firefox was significantly slower than Chrome, but it seems to be speedy now. But uh, anyway... Uh, Firefox is eight years old. Uh, if nothing else, they've given people a choice uh, other than Internet Explorer, which uh, I use Windows for uh, about a year and I couldn't stand it. Um, so uh, kudos to them. Happy eighth birthday. Here's uh, hoping for many more. Uh, which brings us to a famous uh, part of the show, which is hopefully going to wrap things up. It's called, not the news, but the pew-pews. Pew-pew. Pew! 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 No, no. Not pew. Le pew. John McAfee of McAfee Virus Software is wanted on murder charges. You know, uh, uh. <laughs> who needs a vi- I... who needs a virus when you got a gun? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sunday, 11th of November, 8 a.m., acting upon information received, San Pedro police visited some San Pedro town where they saw a 52-year-old U.S. national Gregory Viant fall of the said address lying face up in a pool of blood with an apparent gunshot wound in the upper rear part of his head. Apparently dead. Yeah, I think so. Uh, damn. Um, okay, so uh, that's weird. Apparently, he's uh, uh, he's been hanging out in um, Central America um, somewhere, and uh, things have not been going well for him. So, Do you think cocaine was involved? <laughs> uh, look, uh, according to the article, there was some mention of bath salts, and also uh, he may have been he may have had a, a methamphetamine or uh, what's the other one? Where did it go here? Why are you coming down to my level? <laughs> <laughs> All I'm going to say is maybe the moral, the empty moral husk of having a, devoting a life to peddling antivirus software <laughs> maybe created this void that he could only fill with violence. Pew, pew. <laughs> Next, we have a story. 
this is our Weird Asia link of the week. It's kind of misleading. Uh, it's from CNET, and it says, Korea celebrates a toilet-themed theme park. It's actually not a theme park. It's some guy's the, house. Yeah. Yeah, so this guy really liked uh, being in the shitter, and uh, he decided to build his house in the shape of a toilet, and so the toilet, his toilet house is now turned into a museum. Um, uh, I know uh, when I was in Taiwan, I went to a toilet-themed restaurant, which is um, interesting. Uh, I ate ice cream out of a pretend urinal, but I didn't. I don't know. I think I think I missed you something. Went in the there, translation. You went to that place. I did. How could I not go? I remember that being, you know, uh, a thing, a meme for a little while. Yeah, I, I went well after, of course, because I was late to the game. Um, so I. Uh, maybe this is tangentially away. I, I posted something in a tweet earlier today because I know you all pay strict attention to everything I tweet. Uh, I'm a big fan of Japanese toilets only because they uh, don't depend so much on paper, uh, much in the way that you wouldn't wash your hands with paper. Uh, I don't see why you should clean your bum with like paper when you could be using water, which is recyclable and cleaner. Dare, dare I say that this is a poo-poo instead of a pew-pew? <laughs> oh. Fair point. <laughs> Moving on. This is, prob- this is probably my favorite story of the week. Uh, it's uh, I-, I found this somewhere else, but the link I found is from McLean. So, okay, so the story is, apparently, uh, GIF, which stands for Graphic Interchange Format, uh, those things you see on Tumblr all the time, uh, narrowly beat out YOLO, to become uh, Oxford Dictionary's 2012 Word of the Year. Okay, that's a pew-pew in and of itself. But if you go to this McLean's story that we have in the show notes, after about uh, barely two paragraphs, the author of this fine piece (laughs) proceeds to dump no less than four GIFs into his story and then a bunch of YouTube videos explaining what YOLO is. Uh, I, I don't think if I were paying for the, such premium content, I'd be none too happy about this. I don't know what you guys think. Get 20 issues of McLean's for $20 and a bonus gift. Click here to order. <laughs> and a custom gift with your own meme generator.net. Uh, Shane, do you want to talk about the technical merits of, uh, gifts versus, uh, I don't know, <laughs> anything else? Um, I, no, not really. Uh, the, I mean, the one thing I do miss about GIFs and designing websites about, you know, 600 years ago was that every single website, uh, out there when animated GIFs were, you know, being rendered by the primitive browsers of the day, um, it was kind of interesting because everyone had explosions on their website. So here are two GIFs being awesome. Hey, gifts aren't dead, buddy. I read Tumblr every day, and if you if you search for the gift tag, you'll see some amazing things. <laughs> uh, and uh, we couldn't we couldn't have a pew pew without giving Mr. Marco the last word. Yolo no go. <laughs> well said, sir. Uh, that brings to an end uh, episode two thousand eleven of uh, Discultured. Almost uh, we do uh, have some two thousand eleven. Uh, oh, sorry, holy, the year is two thousand. crap! We're on fire. The year is 2011. No, wait, it's not. It's 2012. <laughs> hey, it's my first time driving, okay? Uh, episode 211. Thank you for the correction. Uh, we do have one comment on the blog, which is pretty cool. Uh, Mark ST, who's commented before, uh, asked us about something that the Verge cast does, and I think Engadget does this as well. Uh, I'll read the direct quote. Uh, Verge cast has a nice show notes section with timestamps where listeners can cherry pick the topics they want to listen to. So it'd be cool if you guys did something similar. Uh, Oh, he's talking about YouTube. Okay, good. So I don't have to do it. (laughs) I was going to say, uh-uh, boyfriend. (laughs) I ain't going to go there. Uh, We do get the concept, and uh, we'll look at it. Yeah, I'm not... uh... I don't know, Anth, have you been tracking like the, I don't know, views on the YouTube episodes we've done? I think I, I certainly appreciate like you making that available, but I don't know. Is there any, any traction on that? Is that something we want to continue or is it just kind of, <laughs> it takes, uh, it doesn't take a load of work to put it up there. We're not getting great views on it though. Okay. Fair enough. Until so, we I'm... start devlinking. It's just a matter of getting that scroll bar chat room we had tonight. Sharing there what wonderful times they had this evening with their friends throughout the week. 
Yes, we did in fact get a scroll bar. In addition to uh, to the four of us, we also have a boot print, Mr. Henshaw, Mr. Haywood, Jeremy Newton, and uh, Jeff Gignac. Uh, so we welcome everyone in the chat. We and and Soder- Soderman just left. Oh, he just left. What happened? I was just going to give him a shout out. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, we do thank you for coming out. Uh, and we thank everybody for coming out because we record live every single week. Uh, we get started around 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. You can go to disculture.com slash live. Uh, we uh, post uh, our podcast shortly after they're uploaded, usually the next morning, sometimes the night of. Um, uh, and then you'll find it everywhere. Like we said, the aforementioned iTunes, Facebook, uh, also our blog, probably the most important place, Google+, Plus, Twitter, Identica, not Plurk. If you want to send Plurk, let us know. Uh, but, of course, we must stress again that this culture is always spelled with a Y. Why is that, Mr. Ryan Wiseman? Uh, why not to take a chance this week to go and check out cbc.ca for the 2012 Massey Lectures, which are freely available in podcast form, but I don't think will be freely available next week. Uh, it looks like uh, they are going to be on iTunes, maybe. Anywho, uh, yeah, the... Um, the Massey Lecture Series this year was Neil Turok. He's the director of the Perimeter Institute on Theoretical Physics in Waterloo. Good times. And the uh, well, the one I listened to today, what was it about? Anyways, the, the, the general idea is what's, uh, what is coming is likely to be even more significant than a past transformation. We've already seen how mobile communication, the World Wide Web, are opening up global society, providing information and education on a scale vastly larger than ever before. But this is only the beginning. And now, how can new technologies change uh, or how they will change us. Anyways, it's worthwhile checking out. It's a good listen and free this week. Sees cbc.ca. Damn, too smart for the room, sir. Whoa, you guys get smarter by listening <laughs> to the cool <laughs> podcasty things. Why don't you uh, tell us where people can find you on the internet when you're not here and discultured? Uh, at Wiseman is uh, probably the best bet or uh, take on the web.com. Excellent, Mr. Burley, yourself. Oh, sorry, what was the question? I, I was busy searching GIFs on Tumblr. <laughs> Where are you on internet Monday to Tuesday, not Wednesday? Monday to, oh, well, only on Monday and Tuesday I'm on the internet, so the rest of the week I tend to stay off the internet. I don't know why, but apparently I do. Uh, you can find me, of course, at chainsworld.ca, which is amazing and totally awesome, and then, of course, you could always go to uh, you know, you know, your favorite search engine and, and search my name. You'll find me pretty much everywhere. Sweet. Uh, Mr. Marco, in your best grade nine first English class presentation voice, where can people find you? First of all, Andrew Curry, you're my hero. <laughs> Stop. Swoon. <laughs> you, you can find all of my stuff at anthonymarco.com and on Twitter at Anthony Marco. And my hero, Andrew Curry, how about you? Uh, myphonebook.ca. Still writing a book, hoping to get it out by Christmas. Uh, I'm, editing is like hard. It's like you read stuff you wrote before and you're like, eh, it sucks, but I don't know how to change it. <laughs> but it's really good. <laughs> anyway, uh, before we uh, introduce a musical track for this evening, uh, I should point out something, um, given the uh, shout outs we're giving to our community. I have noticed that there's been a little bit of a drop in participation on our Reddit, which is uh, disculture.reddit.com, uh, either that or reddit.com dash slash disculture. Uh, I noticed a lot of the stories are getting like one or two votes, and it's kind of hard for me to pick out the ones that make it to the show. So if you could do me a big personal favor, uh, basically, I think most of the links, uh, will we not agree, go up sort of in that ramp up to Wednesday. So from Monday morning on, you'll start to see new stuff being posted by Anthem and myself. Uh, and and along with uh, Shane, I don't know if you had anything this week, but um, I always... I didn't. I I was a little busy this week. That's okay. That's fine. That's fine. I'm but, sorry. Uh, I'll try better next week. Just as I'm chastising Shane for not submitting links, uh, I would gently chastise our listeners if you could please, 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 if you have a Reddit account, uh, if you've done us that uh, generous favor, if you could come on and vote some stories up, or if there's things you see on there, like stories about Android that you want to get voted down, that's cool too. Just let us know. Give us some direction so we can make the show better for you. Uh, and now, to uh, send us out tonight, we have a musical track. Um this uh, is a bit of a shameless plug for Toronto. Uh, it's a Reddit user whose handle is t.bear. How can you not love that? And if you don't love that, he's throwing 8-bit grenades. 
That's the title of his track. This is on Radio Reddit. It's the number one track for the month. Uh, there's a link in the show notes. It's a bit of uh, 8-bit electro, and I think you're going to dig it. So uh, we're going to go out with that. And uh, uh, I know we're supposed to do some hokey kind of sign-off thing, but um, how about on the count of three, we just sing good night in wonderful four-part harmony. One, two, three. Mm-hmm.